Hello, 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 and welcome to the Chapter 12 lecture. Chapter 12 is all about thermodynamics. So this term might sound familiar because we have done some thermochemistry already, which is slightly different than thermodynamics. So I'm just changing up my pen color here. All right, so thermodynamics. All right, is the study of the relationship between energy and work that's associated with chemical and physical processes. It really is important because it allows us to make predictions about whether reactions are going to be spontaneous or not spontaneous. So basically whether they'll go under given conditions. So thermochemistry is part of thermodynamics. I'm just going to write thermochem. All right, and this was in chapter nine of the OpenStax chemistry textbook that we covered last semester. We covered thermochemistry. We talked a lot about enthalpy and how to calculate enthalpy and measure enthalpy using calorimetry. All right, so thermochemistry is one arm of thermodynamics, but there's other arms that we're going to, really one other arm that we're going to learn. So the purpose of thermochemistry is really to be able to protect whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous or just naturally occur on its own, or whether it will be non-spontaneous. So non-spontaneous reactions require energy input. Um, the classic examples in physics and thermodynamics is really, it's really more physics than chemistry. So <clears throat> um, a classic example of a spontaneous reaction would be water flowing down a hill. Um, the opposite, so if you pour water on, a, on an incline, it will, it will just automatically flow down the hill. All right. It does not flow up the hill. It will never spontaneously flow up the hill. You can make it flow up the hill. You could, you know, use a hose to forcefully shoot it up a hill, okay? Same thing with water on a stove. If you put water on a hot stove, it will get hotter. The temperature will go up, all right? But water will not spontaneously get hotter just sitting on a table at room temperature. So these are some everyday things that we know happen spontaneously or non-spontaneously, and we can make predictions about chemical reactions and physical reactions as well. So here are some examples here um, of some things that happen spontaneously, okay? So in this first example here, we've got gas in um, a container where there's a valve that's shutting these two containers, separating these two containers, and we fill one with gas and the other one is empty. Okay, when we open that stopcock valve, um, gas particles will spontaneously flow into the other chamber until they equilibrate. That forward reaction is spontaneous, okay? Those gas particles will not spontaneously flow back into a single chamber. That just doesn't happen, okay? Um, same thing, we can see this spontaneity um, in thermochemistry itself in thermal equilibrium. So if you have two blocks and let's say the red one is hot and the blue one is cold and you put them together so that they're touching, heat inner or kinetic energy really is transferred from the hot block to the cold block until they equilibrate and both end up being the same temperature and come to the same temperature. In other words, that kinetic energy is distributed evenly throughout the block. Okay, so, um, and it doesn't happen spontaneously in reverse. You, if you put two blocks together that are at the same temperature, they will never spontaneously, just one gets hot and one gets cold. All right, so one thing that we, can say about <clears throat> spontaneous reactions is that what whatever is spontaneous in one direction is always non-spontaneous in the reverse direction. And this is a general trend in, in chemistry that when you reverse a reaction, you sort of reverse the characteristics of that reaction. So 
a reaction that's endothermic in reverse will be exothermic. If it's spontaneous in the forward direction, it will be non-spontaneous in the reverse direction. Okay, so spontaneous processes happen, but this spontaneity doesn't tell us anything about speed. That's in the next chapter when we talk about kinetics. All right, so spontaneous things just means that they go of their own accord. They can be slow or they can be fast. And a classic example of this would be looking at radioactive decay. So these are a couple of, um, a couple of isotopes, radioactive isotopes. This isotope of uranium, uranium-238, right, has an incredibly slow decay rate. It takes thousands of years. Its half-life is thousands of years. Um, so over a period of seven days, virtually like none of it has decayed yet. So it stays, the amount of, of radioactive uranium that's left is still nearly 100%. Whereas technetium, this, this isotope of technetium, has a very short half-life on the order of, I don't know, like a day or two. And so by seven days, it is already like virtually all decayed. So um, technetium decays very quickly. The uranium isotope decays very slowly. They are both decaying spontaneously just at very, very different rates. So I guess something to maybe, maybe take a note of here is that spontaneity does not predict speed of a reaction or rate. That is something we'll talk about in the next chapter on kinetics. So in this chapter, we're just trying, we're just using thermodynamics to determine whether a reaction will go spontaneously or not. So in these pictures that I showed you before with the gas here and the hot block, all right, nothing is actually, there's no chemistry. Um, there's no chemical change. There's no heat or work that's changed, okay? But those processes still happen. So there's really no thermochemistry per se. Um, so sometimes even without the sort of changes or production of energy, um, <clears throat> you still get reactions that are spontaneous. So that's how we know that, ener that energy and heat transfer is not the only component of whether a reaction goes or not. The other component of thermodynamics is something called entropy. So the reason those gas particles move from one side to the other until they equilibrate is because of this um, this concept of entropy, the fact that, that the universe is always sort of moving into a state that is more disordered or random, that having more entropy or more disorder is more favorable. And entropy, I don't know why we use the letter S, but we use the letter S to designate it entropy. Um, entropy is a state function and remember, all state functions, uh, the change is equal to the initial, sorry, the final minus the initial. So the final minus the initial. All right, there is a formula to be able to calculate entropy. It's the heat of the reverse reaction, and that should be subscript, divided by the temperature. I'm not going to go through this formula, but I just wanted to show it um, so that you could sort of understand why the units of entropy are joules per Kelvin. Joules per Kelvin are the units of entropy. So entropy is kind of tricky to explain. It's not a force. It's not like gravity. Um, it's really just a statistical probability um, based on a set of different microstates is what we call them. So um, for example, if we have uh, two, this example down here, okay, if we have four balls, different colors, and two chambers, and they can maybe, you know, permeable, 
it's a permeable membrane here, they can pass three, freely through that and redistribute themselves. So um, there's such, you know, only one scenario where all four of them would be in the left block and only one scenario where they could all be in the right block. There's four scenarios where you could have three in one and one in the other. Um, and there's, uh, or th sorry, three in the left block and one in the right block versus four scenarios where you could have three in the right block and one in the left block. So the scenario, the arrangement that has the most possible states, the most possible um, combinations here is C, all right? And so this arrangement here is going to be, this is the most probable state, thus this is the state that it essentially um, will equilibrate at. So entropy is really a reflection of this statistical probability more so than an actual force that's driving these molecules to arrange themselves this way. It's just that this is the most statistically probable way for things to arrange themselves. And on a small scale, you know, what? what is this? One, two, three, four, five, six. You know, six is not that much bigger than four. So you may be thinking like, well, like that's not that much more probable. But atoms are tiny. And so when we're talking about, you know, a mole of atoms, that likely, this these um, distributions, these um, statistics really become much more significant. And the statistical probability of this state, you know, of one state versus the others, becomes way, way huger than the others. And so that's why entropy, that's really what entropy is. So it's conceptually, it is the fact that um, atoms, molecules, particles, whatever you want to call them, will um, be most probable to be in a more disordered state. And they will preferably, it's more favorable for them to be in a more disordered state. That's the word I was going for. In fact, I've got to refer to my notes here. Okay, so what I wanted to say here is that um, what you need to know is that a positive change in entropy is, or is what we call an increase in entropy. While a negative delta S value represents a decrease in entropy. So, a positive change means that something is getting more disordered, and a negative change means that something's getting um, less disordered. Sorry, I just, yeah, that's right, less disordered. So less disordered is kind of a double negative. So another way we could say that is it's getting more ordered, more orderly. So some of the different changes that will increase entropy and have a positive delta S the first are phase changes. So these are phase changes in this direction here from solid to gas. So solid state molecules are, are in a very ordered crystalline structure. In a liquid, they're somewhat ordered, somewhat disordered somewhere. They are still having some intermolecular attractions. But in the gaseous stage, they are completely disordered. So that's the stage with the most entropy. So we could say that the um, change in entropy, or the entropy, I should say entropy, of a solid is less than the entropy of a liquid, which is less than the entropy of a gas. Okay, so if something is going from solid to liquid or solid to gas, then we would say it's increasing its entropy. Um, the second thing that can increase entropy that we can see on this chart here is, is temperature. And when we increase temperature, we increase the speed and the kinetic energy of particles. And they're moving faster. And so they can have more random arrangements, essentially. 
So this curve here looks very much like a heating curve that as we add temperature, all right, temperatures on the x-axis here, if we add temperature to a solid, if we take a solid and we start heating it up and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the entropy is increasing. The, the particles are moving faster and starting to become more um, disordered, more random, and then they reach the melting point where they melt and go into the liquid phase. All right, there's a little bit of entropy change during that um, melting. Now solids and liquids both still have a fair amount of intermolecular forces. So there's not a huge change in entropy between those two states. Okay, but when you go from liquid to gas, there's a much bigger rise in entropy because the particles are really completely separating from each other and really flying around in random disarray. And again, as the gas, even as the gas gets hotter and hotter, the entropy of those particles goes up. They're more disordered if they're moving faster. Um, a third thing that can raise the energy, or sorry, the entropy, the randomness, is um, when you have a reaction where there are more products than there are reactants. So where you have a larger number of product molecules than reactant molecules. So I'm gonna get a new color here. So for example, these are my examples, all right? Calcium carbonate solid reacts to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, okay? So in this case, you have one reactant and you're forming two products. Um, we could also say that we have one mole of reactant and we have two moles of product. All right, so because the number of product particles is increasing, we would say that that has a positive entropy value, positive delta S. Um, in the second one, we've got solid carbon reacting with two moles of water to form a mole of methane and a mole of oxygen, okay? In this case, we have three moles of reactant and two moles of product. So this is sort of a, an exception. So it's not always about the number of molecules, what trumps. The number of molecules, really what we care about most is gas molecules. And I'm going to say gas trumps. What do I mean by that? So in this case, we have a solid and a liquid, and they are reacting to form a gas and a gas. So we're going from solid, to, from solid and liquid, which have less entropy, to two gases, which have more entropy. So we have... Although we have three moles on this side total, we have zero moles of gas. And we have two moles of gas on the product side. So when gas is involved, we generally are just looking at gas. Whichever side has more gas, um, reactions would have a larger number of gaseous product molecules. I'll put that in parentheses. Some reactions don't have any gas. They're all solids and liquids or whatever, but a lot of them do. And so in a lot of cases, you're really looking for which side has more gas specifically, because gas, again, is so high in entropy, right? And then lastly, entropy is going to be greater in mixtures than in pure substances. So if we were to take um, the salt silver chloride and dissolve it in water so that it becomes aqueous, all right, we take that one unit, the formula unit, and it dissociates into two molecules, so more disorder. All right, same if we look even at this picture here, all right, we've got solute and solvent all, you know, bonded to each other and not mixed together, that's much more ordered. All right, when they're all randomly mixed together, that is much more disordered. So this is greater entropy. So as we go from here to here, we are increasing 
our entropy. That would be a positive delta S. Um, same thing with this reaction here. We've got methanol in liquid form. This is a non-electrolyte, so it doesn't dissociate at all, okay, but it is still being becoming soluble in the water. So it's still doing this. All right, so this reaction here, this physical, this physical change of solvation still has a positive delta S. All right, so some basic questions around entropy are, you know, just predict the sign of entropy for the following processes. Is it positive or is it negative? Delta S is what it's asking. All right, so let's look at the first one. One mole of water in liquid form at room temperature goes becomes one mole of water liquid form at 50 degrees Celsius. So room temperature, for reference, you should know this around about now, um, is about 25 degrees, 25 degrees ish, and 50 degrees is warmer than that. So we're heating up. Anytime we're heating up and we're moving molecules faster, we are increasing the entropy. So as a positive delta S. Now let's do part B. Magnesium ions plus bromine ions react to form magnesium bromide. I forgot to put, um, what's it called, uh, states on here, but that's okay. We don't even really need them because what we're seeing is two things becoming one thing. And I'll tell you, none of them are gases, okay? So we have two aqueous ions reacting to form a solid, all right? In this case, this is a decrease in entropy. It's becoming more ordered. Two things are coming together. So that would be a decrease in entropy or negative delta S. Part C, um, CH4 plus H2O reacts to form CO2 and 3H2. So on the left-hand side, on the reactant side, we've got one, two moles of reactant, and they're both gases. So we have two moles on the reactant side. And on the product side, we have two products, but we have a total of four moles, one mole of carbon monoxide and three moles of hydrogen gas. So it's a total of four moles. So we're increasing the number of particles. Um, there's more product than there is reactant, and therefore in terms of number of particles. So then this one we would say has a positive S, a positive entropy. It's increasing its entropy. In part D, ammonia solid becomes ammonia liquid. This is just a phase change, and solid is more ordered than the liquid, so this is increasing in entropy. It's becoming more random, less ordered. And then lastly, we've got 2CH2, 2C2H6 plus 7O2, both are gaseous, reacts to form four carbon dioxides, and six waters. But notice the water is a liquid, okay? So if we look at this reaction on the reactant side, we have two plus seven for a total of nine moles of gas. And on the, react on the product side, we have four plus six for a total of 10, 10 moles total, but only four moles of gas. And since gas has such a higher entropy than the other two states, we kind of neglect the liquid in comparison to the gas. So we're really just comparing moles of gas here. And in this case, even though there's more total moles of product, there's fewer moles of gas. So this one is actually becoming less ordered and has a negative entropy, okay? So, this is, so we just introduced this concept of entropy, which is key and plays a role in the laws of thermodynamics. So there are three laws of thermodynamics. Um, the first one, I can't decide what color I want. All right, we're going to go with black. All right, the first law of thermodynamics
All right, we actually learned this back in chapter nine with thermochemistry, and it's sort of the conservation of energy. It's that the energy of the universe is constant. It is not changing. You cannot create or destroy energy. And this was just to note was back in chapter nine, if you need to review that. And so maybe this equation will ring a bell. The energy of the universe is equal to the change in energy of the system um, plus the change in energy of the surroundings. And in the first law of thermodynamics says that this is equal to zero. That change in energy of the universe is zero, it's constant, right? And so then we got the energy of the system is equal to the negative energy of the surroundings, right? So whatever energy is lost by the system is gained by the surroundings and vice versa. And this was what, you know, we talked about, this led us to our understanding of enthalpy or delta H back in chapter nine. All right, this chapter deals a little bit more. Well, we're gonna pick up enthalpy, it is still relevant, um, but the other component, the second law, not third, second law of thermodynamics is about entropy. It states that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. It is not constant like energy. It is always increasing. And so we could write a similar equation, mathematical equation. The entropy of the universe is going to be equal to the change in entropy of the system plus the change in entropy of the surroundings, all right? But it's not gonna be equal to zero, it's gonna be greater than zero. It's increasing, okay? And then the third law of thermodynamics is also pertaining to entropy. And it's that the entropy of a pure, perfect crystalline substance at zero Kelvin is equal to zero. So basically, at zero Kelvin, at what we call absolute zero, um, where there, it's a temperature where there is no kinetic energy at all, no Brownian motion at all, okay? And so there's also zero entropy at that temperature. So um, we can measure entropy, and when we measure it under standard conditions, we call it standard entropy, and we give it that little degree signal symbol. So standard conditions are one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius, and they have been determined for multiple substances, and you can look up those entropy values on a table, right? Um, and so in the appendix of your textbook, I think it's appendix G, and you could just look these things up. Okay, so standard entropy change, since this is a state function, it's just the final minus the initial. And in a chemical reaction, the products are the final and the reactants are the initial. So we can calculate the standard entropy change. It's equal to the sum of the standard enthalpy of the uh, products minus the sum of the standard enthalpy of the reactants. And then I'm also gonna throw an N in here. This N represents moles, or in the case of chemical reactions, the coefficients in the equation. Okay? because they're basically the moles. So we can figure out the entropy 
almost the same exact way that we figured out enthalpy in chapter nine. So I'm just gonna star this up here. Just, it gets confusing if you don't have the terminology internalized. Enthalpy is the heat of a reaction, delta H. And entropy is randomness or disorder, and it's delta S. All right, the two words sound a lot alike, so you got to make sure you remember which is which and read carefully what a question is asking. So let's do some practice questions and calculate the standard entropy change for uh, this physical change here for uh, water in the gas state going to water in the liquid state. So this would be vaporization. Okay, and we're not trying to find this, the heat of vaporization, we're trying to find the enthalpy of vapor, sorry, the entropy of vaporization here, okay? So I can use that Appendix G in the textbook to look up these standard uh, entropy values. So for gaseous water, it's 188.8 joules per Kelvin. And for liquid water, it happens to be 70 joules per kelvin so much larger for the gas than the liquid which is what we would expect so the um entropy for this the entropy change for this reaction is going to be the entropy of the products the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. So for the product, the product in here is the water, the liquid water, and it is 70 joules per Kelvin minus 188.8 joules per Kelvin gives us a entropy for this reaction of negative 161.1 joules actually just it's just 161 if i'm keeping my sig figs here okay so negative 161 joules per kelvin and we can do a, a mental check here sort of common sense check so if i look at this reaction all right i'm going from a gas to a liquid i would expect this to have a negative delta s a negative entropy because it's becoming more ordered going from gas to liquid and so the fact that my math turns out a negative number that makes sense to me and that checks out so I'm good with that answer so another way we can say this we can we can um, estimate whether it's going to be an increase or a decrease and then we can confirm that so this confirms that it that net negative sign means that there was a decrease in entropy in this reaction. Let's do another example. Calculate the standard entropy change for the combustion of methanol. And here's the equation here. So if I go to that appendix and I look up the entropy, the standard entropy values for each of these, for methanol, it's 126.8 joules per Kelvin. For oxygen, it's 205.03 joules per Kelvin. For carbon dioxide, it's 213.8. 213. And for the water, it is just like it was in the previous problem, since this is in the liquid state, 70 joules per Kelvin. Okay, so my change in entropy for this reaction is going to be the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. All at standard state. Um, so my products are the carbon dioxide and the water. Since there's multiple moles, we need to use that coefficient. So for carbon dioxide, it's gonna be two times 213.8 um, plus for 
waters four times the 70. All right, so that's the sum of the entropies of the products minus the sum of the entropies of the reactants times their coefficients. 126.8 plus 3 times 205.03. So we can do some solving, some simplification here, and I'll write out my steps. 427.6 plus 280 minus 253.6 plus 615.09. This comes out to be 707.6 minus 868.69, which equals negative 161. I did my math wrong somewhere. <laughs> this one is 161.1 joules per Kelvin. So what is 70 minus 188 up here? This is where my typo was on the top problem. So up here, 70 minus 188, you guys are smarter than me. You probably already figured this out, um, is 118.8. That was one. No, I was more than one off. Okay, so there's my corrected answer there. Still, it's a decrease in entropy. So I didn't catch my little my little um, arithmetic error there. Had I had been off in the sign, I would have caught that. Okay, let's go back to this exam, the second example problem, and and check ourselves. So if we look at this equation here. Um, on the reactant side and the product side, um, we've got two moles of liquid and three moles of gas. And I'm only going to count the gaseous moles. So I have three moles of gas on the reactant side. On the product side, I have two moles of gas, four moles of liquid that I don't care about. So I'm going from more to less. So I'm going to be getting less, there's less entropy. There's more order and less disorder. So I would expect this to have a negative delta S, and that is indeed what I found. Again, this is a reaction that is decreasing in entropy, it has a negative delta S. Okay, and so as it turns out, in order for a process to be spontaneous, it needs to have favorable entropy and favorable enthalpy. And so there is a third thermodynamic like factor um, that takes both of those into account. It relates entropy and enthalpy, and we call it Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy. And it is really the true predictor of whether a reaction is going to be spontaneous or not. We can partially predict whether it's going to be spontaneous, whether based on the entropy and the enthalpy, um, but not always. And I'll show you that in a second. So what is the most um, thermodynamically favorable is a negative enthalpy, negative delta H. Okay, so exothermic reactions are more thermodynamically favorable and positive changes in entropy or increases in entropy, positive delta S, are the most thermodynamically favorable is what we say. That's the language, the terminology. All right, so reactions that have negative enthalpy and positive entropy are always spontaneous. And, and I can show you that mathematically. So the formula for Gibbs free energy, represented by a G, okay, 
it's equal to the change in heat or the enthalpy minus the temperature times the change in entropy. Okay, and a note for you here that temperature is in Kelvin. <clears throat> and that's because our, our entropy value is joules per Kelvin, so we need it to match. Okay, so we have a couple of different scenarios here. If ideally you have a negative delta H and a positive delta S, so it's an exothermic reaction and it has an increase in disorder. If that is the case, then the reaction is going to be spontaneous, always. Always spontaneous. Okay. Um, the opposite, if the opposite is true, then it's going to be like this. It will always be non-spontaneous, or I'll say it's never spontaneous. All right. Um, let's look at what happens to delta G in these situations. So if, if this number is negative and delta, if delta S is positive, then this whole value is going to be negative because of this negative sign here. We multiply it by a temperature and temperature in Kelvin is never negative. It's always positive. Okay. So if our in, enthalpy is negative and our entropy is positive, then our Gibbs free energy is always going to be negative. So a negative delta G is spontaneous. Um, so negative delta G is spontaneous. If we flip those values, so if our enthalpy is positive and our entropy is negative, then delta G is always going to be positive. So a positive delta G is not spontaneous. That indicates a non-spontaneous reaction. Now there's a couple of other scenarios. You could have a scenario where the uh, reaction is endothermic, so it has a positive delta H, which is not very thermodynamically favorable, but it does have an increase in entropy, which is thermodynamically favorable. Well, depending on what those numbers are, you might get a positive delta G or you might get a negative delta G. And the conditions in which you get a positive, or sorry, a negative delta G, a spontaneous reaction, is at high temperatures. So we say that this is spontaneous at high temperatures. And then vice versa, if we have both of these are negative, so the enthalpy is favorable, but the entropy is not, it could turn out either way. It will be spontaneous at low temperatures. When T is small, then um, this value will <clears throat> ensure that if T is small, I have to think about this. If T is small, then this would be a smaller value. Yes, because we ultimately want G to be negative. I can't do these substitute thing, math things in my head, but we, we're going to work some out. We'll work, I'm going to work an example problem for you to show you um, the, the difference between two reactions, a reaction at two different temperatures, one where it's spontaneous and one where it isn't. Okay, so although we think thing that, you know, things really spontaneous, the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of the universe is increasing. So generally things will, or reactions, whether they're physical or chemical, will go in a direction that increases the disorder or increases the entropy, but they can spontaneously become more ordered and that is if it's very in if it's very thermo thermo uh if the enthalpy is favorable so if it's a very exothermic reaction it may actually still happen spontaneously even if it results in a more highly ordered scenario so that's the point of gibbs free energy is it takes into account the role that both enthalpy and entropy play 
on the spontaneity of a reaction. And delta G can kind of be thought of as a measure of whether or not a reaction is spontaneous. So I'm just going to jot this down here. It doesn't really make sense, but a positive delta G is non-spontaneous and a negative delta G is spontaneous. All right, so we can use um, our enthalpy and entropy data from our appendix, from tables, reference tables, in order to calculate delta G, to calculate the Gibbs free energy for a reaction and determine whether it's spontaneous or not. So let's do that with this reaction here. So here it says calculate whether water in the gas phase moving to water in the liquid phase, so water evaporating. No, sorry, gas to liquid is condensation. All right, um, calculate whether condensation is spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. So let's do this. Um, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So the first thing I need to do is calculate. Um, so in this table here, I'm given the, the uh, enthalpy, standard enthalpy, and the standard entropy. So I could use, I can calculate, um, and I've given those for each of the components for the reactant and the product. So I can calculate the enthalpy of the reaction and the entropy of the reaction using this sort of standard state, the um, not standard state, uh, state function formula of final minus initial. So the heat of formation of products minus the heat of formation of reactants. So the delta H for this reaction is the product, so the heat of formation of the liquid, which is negative 286.83 kilojoules per mole, minus the heat of formation of the, of the reactant, which was the gas, negative 241.82. All right, um, a negative, minus a negative is the same as adding. Um, and if I work out the math there, I get negative 45.01 kilojoules per mole. All right, so it's an exothermic reaction. I'm just going to note that here and remind you of these thermochemistry terms. It's exothermic. It has a negative delta H. It's releasing energy. Um, now for the entropy of this reaction... All right, and we can look at this reaction too and just kind of guess is our entropy, do we expect it to be a positive or a negative value? It's going from gas to a liquid, it's becoming more ordered and less random, so that is decreasing the entropy. So we expect this to come out to be a negative number as well. Um, so here we're also going to say, sorry, the entropy of the products minus the entropy of the reactants. And the product in this case is liquid water. So that's going to be 70 minus, neg or sorry, minus, uh, seventy minus 188.8 joules per mole K equals 118.8. Joules per mole Kelvin, negative, sorry, negative 118.8. So it does come out to be negative, which is what we expected. And so now we have our enthalpy, we have our entropy. The only thing we're missing is our temperature, except we're not missing it. We're given 25 degrees Celsius, but I need my temperature to be in Kelvin. So I'm just going to do quick little math here to convert to Kelvin, 298K. So now I can plug into that formula uh, that we started with, the Gibbs free energy. 
right? So our delta H that we calculated is negative 45.01 minus our temperature times the enthalpy. Sorry, entropy. <laughs> I will mix those words up coming out of my mouth. And this ends up being negative 9.6 kilojoules. All right. In other words, it has a negative delta G. In other words, we can say thus it is spontaneous. I spelled that wrong, but whatever. It is spontaneous. The negative delta G means that it is spontaneous. And we kind of know this because we're pretty familiar with the phase changes of water. And we know that at room temperature, steam will condense into water. It, that's, you know, something we've all probably witnessed. So this answer makes sense. But the next question says, basically, will that steam condense into water at a higher temperature? of 125 degrees Celsius, which is beyond the boiling point of water. So your gut reaction should tell you no. What you know about phases and phase changes at higher temperatures, water exists as a gas, not as a liquid. It's above the boiling temperature. So that should not be a spontaneous reaction. Let's see if the math plays out that way. So we're again using this equation and since I stuck with the same equation, we can use the calculations from the previous problem. The delta H is not changing, so the delta H is still, or the enthalpy is still negative 45.01 kilojoules per mole. And the thing that's changing here is our temperature. So 125 degrees Celsius is 398 Kelvin. times the change in enthalpy, entropy, sorry, delta S, negative 118.8 joules per mole Kelvin. And we get a um, Gibbs free energy here of 2.21 kilojoules or kilojoules per mole. All right, this is a positive, a positive, delta G. So that means that this is not spontaneous at this temperature. All right, so just to scroll up to that little cheat sheet chart up here. All right, the problem we just did, all right, it had a negative um, enthalpy and a negative entropy. And we found that at lower temperatures, it is spontaneous, but at higher temperatures, it was not. So at 25 degrees, it was, but at 125, it was not. So we saw this sort of, this sort of uh, pattern or whatever in action. So another way, so we can, we can use these two um, values, the entropy and the enthalpy in order to calculate the Gibbs free energy. But Gibbs free energy is itself a state function. And the Gibbs free energy of formation of substances can be calculated and tabulated and is also readily available in an appendix table. So an, I guess, arguably simpler way to calculate um, delta G is just to use the heat of formate, or sorry, the um, Gibbs free energy of formation and just do products minus reactants, just like we do with enthalpy and entropy. So um, here is an example problem. It says calculate whether uh, barium carbonate decomposing into barium oxide and carbon dioxide is spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, first, let's make a prediction, all right? I see a solid decomposing into a, one mole of solid and one mole of gas. 
So there's more particles and specifically more, more gaseous particles on the product side, which tells me that it's increasing in disorder. It's becoming more random. So I expect it to have a positive um, entropy, and that is favorable, thermodynamically favorable. I don't know anything about the heat of the reaction. It's not telling me that, so I can't... Um, I can't really just look at the reaction and predict whether it's going to be spontaneous or not, though I think it might be because it has a positive entropy. But at this temperature, that might not be true. So now I'm going to look at a table and I'm going in Appendix G and I'm going to find the standard Gibbs free energy of formation for each of these substances. So for barium carbonate, it is negative. 1,139 kilojoules per mole. So all of these are just going to be kilojoules per mole. For the barium oxide, it's negative 520.3. And for the carbon dioxide, it's negative 394.36. So I can do, to get the standard free energy of this reaction, it's just going to be the sum of the standard free energies of the products minus the sum of the standard free energies of the reactants. And that also includes a multiplier of the coefficient, if there's any coefficients here. And in this problem, there's none. They're all one. So um, the products, the products, there's two products. There's the barium oxide, which has a... Gibbs free energy of 520.3 plus the carbon dioxide, which has a Gibbs free energy of negative 394.36. So those are, that's, we're summing the um, Gibbs free energy of the products now minus the Gibbs free energy of the reactants, and there's only one reactant. And all of these are in units of kilojoules per mole. So I end up with, this is negative 914.66. And when you subtract a negative, it's the same as adding 1139, which gives us a total of 224.34. Thus, this is not spontaneous. A positive delta G is not spontaneous. So at this temperature, it wasn't spontaneous. But at a lower temperature, it could be. So um, an interesting thing about reactions and thermochemistry and thermodynamics is that we can couple reactions. We can take a spontaneous reaction and pair it with a non-spontaneous reaction and essentially use it to fuel that non-spontaneous reaction and make it go. So an example of that is if we take these two reactions here. So if we take zinc sulfide, the decomposition of zinc sulfide into solid zinc and solid sulfur, right, it has a very large positive delta G. It is very not spontaneous, all right? Versus the second reaction here, sulfur reacting with oxygen to form sulfur dioxide, that is a very negative, it's negative 311. So this one is a very spontaneous reaction. So when we combine these two, when we add these two to together, that solid sulfur ends up canceling out, and we get this overall equation down here, all right, so zinc sulfide plus oxygen, in the presence of oxygen, it's a more efficient way to make solid zinc because this, when we add these two reactions together, all right, we get a delta G. This is me adding these two reactions together, and we get a Gibbs free energy of negative 98.8. And so this overall reaction becomes spontaneous. So if you want to take zinc sulfide and break it down, 
um, do a decomposition reaction into zinc and sulfur, you can't do that with just zinc sulfide. But if you burn it, if you heat it in oxygen, in air, you can make that reaction go. And you can make it spontaneously produce solid zinc for you. So another similar reaction is in extracting copper from a popular copper ore that is made up of copper one sulfide. When you heat that ore, the copper one sulfide decomposes to form solid copper and solo monoatomic sulfur. The first thing this question is asking you to do is to write out the balanced equation. This is just practicing your skills again from last semester. So copper one has a one plus charge and sulfide is a group six sulfur. It's the ion of sulfur. And since it's in group six, it has a negative two charge. So um, our formula is going to be Cu2 and it's in the problem there. Cu2S. All right, and it is a solid ore and it decomposes into solid copper and solid monoatomic sulfur, meaning just one atom of sulfur. Um, so that would be the, oh, it's not balanced. I need two coppers. Now it's a balanced equation. Uh, and then the second thing says, determine the delta G for the decomposition reaction. I'm going to assume that this is going to be, I would think this would be spontaneous because we're going from one solid particle to two solid particles, but we don't really know. So this little degree symbol here always reminds us that it's in standard state conditions and standard state is 25 degrees Celsius. Just pointing that out in case you ever feel like you're missing temperature information. Um, but for this problem, we're just going to use the delta G of formation, or the Gibbs free energy of formation. I'm going to rewrite out the equation first. Copper sulfide reacts to form two copper and one sulfur. So if I look up in that appendix, the delta G of formation for each of these, for the copper sulfide, it's negative 86.2. And for the copper and the sulfur, it's zero, just like the heat of formation is zero for pure elemental substances. All right, so our change in Gibbs free energy is the products, zero plus zero, minus the reactants, negative 86.2. So the delta G for this is actually positive. It's 86.2, and I should use my units, kilojoules, okay? So we thought, looking at the equation, although the entropy changes, it's a positive change in entropy, we would predict, um, it must be a really positive um, enthalpy as well, because we got a very um, positive delta G, which means that this is not spontaneous at room temperature. Um, in the second part of the problem, it says the reaction of monoatomic sulfur with oxygen yields gaseous sulfur dioxide. First things first, write out the balanced equation. So we've got monoatomic sulfur um, that's reacting with oxygen, and oxygen is a diatomic gas. It's always O2, it's not O. Reacts to form sulfur dioxide, SO2, which also happens to be a gas. And it, now it wants us to determine the delta G for the reaction. So if I um, look up on a table what the um, Gibbs free energy of formation is for each of these. For sulfur and oxygen, it is zero. You know what, I wanna use a different color. So I'm just using, this is me pretending to go to the table and look these values up. So for sulfur, it's zero. For oxygen, it's zero. And for sulfur dioxide, it is negative 300.1 kilojoules. That's sloppy. 
we'll just say negative 300 kilojoules. All right, so our delta G is going to be the products, negative 300 kilojoules, minus the reactants, and both of them are zero. All right, so our delta G for this reaction is negative 300, and it's 300.1, so I'm just going to write that there. Okay, so this third part of the question says, show how coupling the two equations above, which is what you do when you roast that mineral, I can't even say what a chalcolite, in air, makes for a more efficient production of copper. So if we take that first equation, which I'll rewrite here, we had copper sulfide reacting to form copper and sulfur, two of these technically. And it had a Gibbs free energy in standard state of, what was it? <laughs> 86.2 kilojoules. And then the second reaction, oops, just above here on this page was the sulfur plus the oxygen gas reacting to form sulfur dioxide. And the Gibbs free energy of this reaction was negative 300.1 kilojoules. All right, we can add these two reactions together. Um, and when we add these two reactions together, the sulfurs are going to end up canceling out. Everything else, though, stays, so when I add these together, I end up with Cu2S plus oxygen. Those are the two reactants, and they form the products of copper and sulfur dioxide. And our new Gibbs free energy for this will just be the sum of these two reactions, so we'll have 86 uh, it'll be 386.3 kilojoules. Nope, sorry, can't do math. Our, I do have an eraser, though. I just added those together, but uh, neglected my minus sign. Um, so just redoing my math. So 86.2 minus 300.1 or plus negative 300.1 is negative 213.9 kilojoules. All right, so coupling these two reactions by adding these two reactions together, all right, we get a reaction that has, uh, that happens spontaneously, essentially. Um, and so that is actually how copper is mined, or not mined, but made from this ore, extracted from this ore using chemistry and coupling this reaction. So coupling reactions is particularly important. I forgot to do some notes up here. I'm going to go back up here. No, I just meant to mention it. All right. Um, as a personally as a biochemistry person. Um, coupling reaction is particularly important in biochemistry. Um, the way that cells make ATP is through a process of chemical coupling. In fact, pretty much all chemical processes in the cell occur through um, chemical coupling of reactions. You take an, uh, an endothermic reaction you couple it with an exothermic reaction and you use the energy to fuel it. You take a non-spontaneous reaction and you pair it or couple it with a spontaneous reaction and that drives it. We'll even see um, in uh, thermo or electrochemistry later in the semester that this, this theme just continues, this ability to couple chemical reactions in order to make one that normally wouldn't go or wouldn't happen. Um, we use the second reaction to sort of fuel it, if you will, in reaction coupling. So that is the end 
of chapter 12. Bye now.